and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do anything. Look at the world has gone after.
city of Jerusalem. This morning we join in praise and celebration, proclaiming along the way all of our hopes, all of our expectations for Jesus, our King. What a grand and glorious celebration this day. We're here for the sounds of Holy Week, and it begins with enthusiasm and praise. The city of Jerusalem was brimming with people. They were gathered for the festival of the Passover. Many had traveled days and weeks, some from neighboring villages, all coming to the temple to offer their sacrifices, to praise and to worship. There's already a certain energy pulsing through the city with so many people there. And then on top of it, there's a buzz spreading throughout the crowd. They've heard Jesus is coming. Jesus, this mysterious man who they've all heard about in some way because he's been teaching and preaching, you know, around the villages and on the hillsides. He's been telling stories about God and about God's kingdom. He's been healing. Healing people from lifelong illnesses and casting out demons. He's come and been performing signs and miracles for the multitudes. Who is this man? Can he really be who he says he is? Is there a chance, just a small chance, that he really could be the Son of God? Could he actually be the Messiah they've waited for? They can only hope so. Those following Jesus and gathering in Jerusalem shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord, save us. They took their branches to wave and salute him as they rode into the city. And they laid their cloaks out on the ground to make his path. All of their hopes and their expectations fully invested in this man, this Jesus, that he could be and that he would be their king, the one to save him. A one who would come with power and restore Israel. One who would establish God's kingdom, the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even as he comes into Jerusalem, he fulfills the prophecies of Isaiah. Your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. He's got to be the one. The one the scriptures foretold. Can you feel the energy? The buzz? The adrenaline rush? Can you place it? It's hope. Someone who can save us? It's hope. Someone who is everything that we've yearned for. Hope. To comfort us, to heal us, to renew us. Could this really be what we have been hoping for? We all know there's more to the story. There's more waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem than a crowd of hopeful followers. Jesus knew it. The crowds even knew it too. They knew there were plots against him. They knew the Pharisees and the chief priests were out to arrest Jesus. And yet they placed their hope in him, that he would be the one. So they gathered their palm branches and they shouted their words of praise, witnessing to their expectations. Hosanna, Hosanna, their voices echoing the psalms of praise. Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. 
and their shouts grew louder and louder as he went by, waving their palms more and more fervently, save us, Hosanna to the king, trying to convince themselves, Hosanna, Hosanna, as if their praise and pomp could will him to be their king as if their passion was enough to make it so. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. And saying to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? Then he left them, went out to the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. In the morning when he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the side of the road, he went to it and found nothing at all on it but leaves. Then he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they were amazed, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Jerusalem was teeming with people. The temple was the focal point of everything, designed and built as a place of praise and prayer, sacrifice and worship. It was the specific dwelling place of God, the meeting place where people came to be in God's presence, a place of connection between God and the people on earth. All week it was alive, with pilgrims coming to see it, coming there to pray, coming into the different courts on the outside, to put their offerings into the receptacles on the walls, coming with sacrifices of all kinds to give to God. They were seeking cleansing from their sins, seeking to deal with all kinds of other issues as well. There were ceremonial cleansings. There were purification rites. The temple was the center of it all. Jesus went into the city, headed straight to the center of the action. How quickly things change. From that triumphant entry, from the parade filled with hosannas, we don't know the exact timing. Maybe it was the afternoon on the same day of his entry into the city, or maybe it was on Monday. Either way, it was within the first 24 hours. Jesus entered the temple and observed the action. The outer courts were filled with money changers and merchants. Especially during the week of the Passover, this was the norm for the temple to be full swing. God's law required everyone, every Jewish male, to come and celebrate the festival from all over the world. And even some who were not ethnically Jewish, they came also. 
In temple worship, you see it focused on animal sacrifice. There are a lot of God-given rules for what condition the animals had to be in. There are a lot of reasons why you probably weren't going to bring your own animal for the sacrifice. It needed to be certified and unblemished. You couldn't travel with livestock. So people bought their sacrifices when they arrived. But to do that, you needed the right kind of money. Jewish sacrifices could not be purchased with Roman money. That means the first thing that anyone would encounter at the temple were the buyers and sellers, the money changers. No one seemed to think that this was a problem. We might overlook something like this because we really don't have anything similar in our practice. However, when money gets involved, the chief priests, the money changers, the merchants, they were less than faithful. They manipulated the exchange rates so that they could make more money. They overcharged for the animals, knowing that there were no other options. They were cheating the people. Surely the priests were getting a cut too. You see, the coordination of worship had become a hindrance to actually being able to worship, and especially for the poor. So Jesus came into the city, and he entered the temple, the center of worship and praise, and he observed what was going on. I imagine him standing there, frozen in his footsteps. Maybe mouth open, jaw dropped, speechless. Looking around at what a place of <coughs> worship had become. How people were being treated and taken advantage of. Maybe it was in shock. Maybe in disbelief or outrage. <coughs> He drove the money changers out of the temple. Those selling livestock, he called them thieves. He cleared out the impurity of the temple. Jesus upended hundreds of years of norms, of expectations, of systemic oppression, the barriers that kept the poor and the sick and the unworthy, the outsiders, the things that kept them from the worship of God were cleansed from the temple, removed from the dwelling the place of God, so that all would be able to enter, so that all would be welcome. I wonder. What would God cleanse today? Thank you. 
Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat it. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, And when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I saw it. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he said the same with the, did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to the one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. Welcome to worship today. This little spoon, I don't know if you can see it because it's very small, is similar to those I have received or those I've used in Southeast Asia, Burma, Thailand, Philippines. For soup to rice, its purpose is for feeding the body. I received this one in a conference bag in 2013 in Burma, celebrating the 200th anniversary of Baptist missionaries arriving to share the gospel. If you all have been to conferences, you don't usually get a spoon in your bag. So why a spoon? Folks in Southeast Asia often greet each other with, have you eaten? Rather than hello. Having this spoon was an invitation to the table, any table, to feed my body, but also my soul with the fellowship there. Although Jesus had some business to do at the table, it was also a time of gathering and fellowship. Now, here, is a time of fellowship as well. If we were at the 11 o'clock service, you would hear the sounds of people walking around and greeting each other and hugs and shaking hands. <clears throat> the service is a little more subdued. <laughs> but you would hear those sounds of fellowship. You hear it in the gathering space before you came in. We feed our souls with friendship. So, have you eaten today? We welcome guests. Um, we're so glad you're here. There's a card in the pew. If you would like to fill that out and help us get to know you a little, we won't land on your doorstep unless you ask us to. So today, think. Have you eaten? And how can you feed others? It's break the nose. 
Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came, and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will. Deepest thou, couldst not thou watch one hour?
Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face and say, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of those disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. It's been a long day for Peter. Clearly, it's been a long week. Their festival celebrations have gone for several days. The disciples made preparations for the Passover, and then they shared a meal with Jesus. That night, Peter had tried to stay awake, keeping watch and praying, but they were so tired, so tired from following their beloved friend and teacher, Jesus. Then, Peter watched as Jesus was arrested by the authorities, betrayed by Judas. Peter was so upset that he drew his own sword and struck one of the soldiers, cutting off his ear. The authorities questioned him and made accusations against him. Can you imagine Peter? watching his leader, his friend, go through all of this. Peter was so loyal, so faithful. He cared deeply for Jesus. And even after Jesus was arrested, Peter continued to follow him. But now he followed from a distance. He hesitated to be too close to Jesus for fear of being recognized as a disciple. And then the gatekeepers in the courtyard take him by surprise. And flustered and frightened and caught in the moment, he denied knowing Jesus. His loyalty gone. Denying his teacher and his friend. Just like Peter, it's so hard for us to keep going strong. We do our best to be faithful, to follow Jesus as best we can. Yet sometimes we follow from a distance. By our silence, 
by our hypocrisy, by our failure to love. Sometimes we let down the people most important to us by acting in self-interest, by acting in hate or bitterness, by denying our relationships. It's easy to be strong in our faith when everything is going well. It's easy to be strong until someone catches us by surprise. One little thing trips us up. One little thing separates us from Jesus. Our own fear of rejection. Our own fear of getting hurt. So we just keep silent. We do things we know we shouldn't do. Fear and faith coexist in our lives. Rejection and faithfulness get all tangled up. Despite our good intentions, despite our best efforts, without even realizing it, our faithfulness melts away. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him. They say, they were saying, We found this man perverting our nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor and saying that he would himself was a messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest, the crowd, I find the basis for accusations against this man. But they were insistent, and they said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all of Judea and Galilee, even to this place. And then Pilate called together the chief priests and the leaders and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence, and I have not found him guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has nothing, he has done nothing to deserve death. And therefore, I'll have him flogged, and then I'll release him. They all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas, Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. And they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And a third time they said to them, What evil has he done? I have found him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged, and I will release him. But they kept urgently demanding loud shouts and he sh that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demands should be granted. The power of a crowd can be overwhelming. You can feel the momentum and the emotion of a crowd. Sometimes it's the thrill of excitement. Other times it might be from anticipation and suspense. And still other times there's waves of disappointment or of doubt. Whatever the atmosphere is like, the crowd seems to take on a personality of its own. We don't dare try to go against the crowd, to turn the attention to ourselves, or to convince them of another way. It's so much easier just to give in and go with the flow. It takes too much effort to keep fighting for the right thing. Think about the momentum of the crowd that gathered around Pilate, how they were screaming and shouting. We found him perverting our nation. Their voices were echoing getting louder and louder, trying desperately to convince Pilate. He was teaching in our synagogues. Their anger was building. 
and build him. He stirs up the people by his teaching. Everyone has joined together now, and the crowd is overwhelming. He says that he himself is the Messiah. They feel threatened by this man, who seems to be taking their power. He says that he is king. They're desperate not to lose control. It's so easy to get caught up in the crowd, to go along with what's going on around us. We join in accusing someone else, regardless of what we know to be true. We let our fear and anger build up, and sometimes it just gets out of control. What happens when we feel threatened? Away with this fellow. What lengths will we go to in order to have control? Away with him. It doesn't matter what actually happened. We are above all else. Release Baratus for us. Society tells us to look out for ourselves, to put others down, to get even. Away with him. Jealousy runs wild as others seem to have more. More attention. More success, more power. Crucify him. him. Crucify him. So they make him the target. Crucify, Crucify him. Three times, Pilate opposed the crowd. Crucify him. Three times, Pilate tried to defend Jesus. Crucify him. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And strike him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and said to them, Here's the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who, is cla who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carried the cross by himself. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Bogatha. There they crucified him, and with him two others one on either side, with Jesus between them. A simple sound can stir up long-held memories and take you back to childhood. This was likely one of the very first sounds that Jesus was conscious of as a baby and as he grew up. Joseph, his father, was a carpenter. And his carpenter shop would probably have 
just been a part of the family home. So Jesus likely went and apprenticed with Joseph. They would have fashioned plows and hoes for farmers, carts for traders. They would have been helping people. But then, on that Friday at noon, the sound echoing signified something completely different. Soldiers using a hammer and board for an opposite purpose. For pain, for suffering, for death. A source of destruction as they crucify the Son of God between two robbers. The very same implements used oh so differently. The hammer and the nails force us to face the struggles, the violence and the pain that we know within ourselves, however carefully hidden it may be for most of the time. <clears throat> Yet despite all our thoughtlessness and even our deliberate destruction, God is always seeking to work good through them. Agonizing and painful though the sounds were on Good Friday, they have still come to be seen as a means by which God continues to save people. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there when they nailed him? It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there when they crucified my